Going from an idea sketched on the back of a napkin to a robust, stable product requires a wide range of skills. You can spend ages looking for a one in a million developer who can do it all, or you can quickly ramp up an entire product team to help you build and launch a product with our sponsor, DevSquad. DevSquad provides an entire development team packed with top talent from Latin America. Your elite squad will include from two to six full stack developers, a technical product manager, plus experts in product strategy, UI UX design, DevOps, and QA, all working together to make your SaaS product a success. You can ramp up an entire product team fast in your time zone and at rates 75% cheaper than a comparable US-based team. And with DevSquad, you pay month to month with no long-term contracts. Take the hassle out of assembling and managing a sprawling team of freelancers and work with a group that's ready to hit the ground running. Visit devsquad.com slash startups and get 10% off your engagement. That's devsquad.com slash startups. Welcome back to another episode of Startups for the Rest of Us. I'm Rob Walling, and this week I'm joined by fan favorite Derek Reimer as we answer your questions. Questions from listeners just like you with topics ranging from whether you should build technical or business skills as a founder, how to bootstrap in a competitive market, whether you can outsource marketing, and how to think about SaaS pricing when you have a variability to your cost structure. Before we dive into that, I want to let you know it's your last chance to get tickets to MicroConf Atlanta. The event is April 21st through the 23rd. Speakers include Rand Fishkin from SparkToro, Asia Aranjo from Demand Maven, Stephen Steers, myself, and Dr. Sherry Walling. It's going to be hosted and emceed by me and Leanna Patch of Punchline Copy. I'm also going to be doing a fireside chat with Ben Chestnut, the co-founder of MailChimp. He does not do very many public appearances, and so I'm very excited to host him at MicroConf this year. MicroConf.com slash US if you're interested in grabbing tickets. Again, tickets are going to sell out soon. So if you're thinking about joining me and about 225 of your closest Bootstrap founder friends, head to MicroConf.com slash US. And with that, let's dive into the questions. Derek Reimer, thanks so much for joining me on Startups for the Rest of Us. It's a pleasure to be back. Yeah, it's great to have you, man. We're going to dig into some really interesting listener questions today. So let's kick it off with our first one about whether to learn technical or business skills for a future founder. Hi Rob, my name is Thomas and I'm a CS student from Central Europe. I'm exploring my career options and I find your mindset and values very inspiring. My question is, should I focus on developing my technical skills and become a killer dev first? Or should I start learning the business side of things and start building the level one business while I'm still studying? I've heard different opinions from different people, but I'd like to hear your perspective since you're the author of the mythology I'm following. I really appreciate your views on the role of luck in business, the importance of free time and family. Most of the advice I found sounds like running a startup could be compared to fist fighting a lion while blindfolded. For some context, I'm 20 years old, I've been coding for about six years and I'm planning to keep studying for next three to four years. I have some part-time experience as a full-stack web developer, and I'm currently involved in a student startup that is building a hardware and software solution. Thank you for answering my question and for all the value you provide. So as someone who never faced this quandary, Derek, because you learned to code when you were a teenager, right? So you kind of, by the time you were 20, you were the age of the, of the OP here, you knew it was like, well, I know how to code, so maybe I'll add the business side of it, right? But at a certain point, like I do think that we can weigh in as two people who have both these skills. Me, past tense, had development <laughs> skills. Hey, no. I can still code yep. PHP and C sharp. <laughs> I know. I wouldn't want to ship production code. But what is? What are your thoughts on this? Well, first of all, I think fist fighting a lion while blindfolded. Maybe that's the tagline for your next book. I don't I know. I love that analogy. I love it. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was good. Um, no, I think I think it's it, it's a good question to ask. Based on how he described his experience, he said, you know, I, I've 
I have some part-time experience as a full-stack web developer. I've been coding for six years. To me, that sounds like he might have enough of the the raw material to be able to get into you know B two B SaaS or you know building line of business applications. I mean, if he wants to build something that's extremely deep in kind of CS type stuff, like I don't know low level algorithms or large language models or something, then you coding LLMs from scratch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you might need some of that more like deeper technical skills. But I mean, to build a CRUD application, I, I would suspect that. That his technical skills already probably outstrip his business and marketing skills. So, given that, I mean, my my encouragement would be: I'm sure he's aware of your your stair step approach. You know, kind of uh, of starting with with um, smaller, more manageable projects to gradually build up a skill set. But you know, if I were if I were in your shoes, I would I would be thinking about how to get real world experience under your belt as soon as possible. I mean, as soon as you have the time and the energy to to start working on that. You know, of course, read the literature, read the SaaS playbook, read the mom test about talking to customers, read traction to learn about traction channels and kind of get that that foundational knowledge in your head, but ultimately that'll only get you so far just just studying, you know, the how-tos. You need to actually start start doing in order to build that kind of real world experience. So that's that's probably how I'd be thinking about it if I were him. Yeah, and you're saying doing to learn the kind of the marketing and or sales yeah. side, right? The yep. bi- he was saying the business side versus the technical side. Yeah. And business can be vague. I remember folks being like, I am gonna hire or not hire, but I'm gonna co-found a company with a you know, a business guy or a businesswoman. And it's like, what does that mean? Because if all they're gonna do is set up an LLC and set up a bank account and like do your books, like does it, you don't need the co-founder for that, right? But if they marketing and sales are the thing that are marketing and or sales, depending on the, you know if you're high touch or low touch, are the things that I'd be trying to learn. And then even you know proceeding, kind of coming before that, it's the it's the kind of the skill set for being able to determine if something is actually in demand in the market or not. Like like have you hit on something that people actually want to buy or have you fabricated this in your own head so even like that kind of jobs to be done type of um, type of things like to at least align your hypothesis with hopefully as close to reality as possible I think that's that's a mistake that a lot of us made I made it made that mistake a ton of times early on when I just sort of was more attracted to problems based on how how the technical implementation would look or something I was excited about building but didn't necessarily have a have you know demand in the market. So I think first kind of working on the skill set of being able to identify actual problems and not theoretical ones and then you know how to how to get them out there and market it and sold. It feels like the harder thing is to be really good at marketing or really good at sales. I'm not saying being a really good developer is not hard, but I just feel like I know a lot more really good developers and I know a lot of like pretty good product people, but people who can actually go zero to one with marketing, there just aren't that many. And I struggle with this because I think certainly for him, he already has his six years of, of coding experience. So to me, it's like, of course, take Derek's advice, which is go start learning the, the marketing and or the sales side. It's a natural fit. But what if he had zero in both? That's a tough one. It's like, if you have zero in both, then it depends. It's like, do you want to start SaaS? Do you know that? And if you do, then do you learn coding just enough to know how to evaluate a co-founder and hire someone, but you then learn the marketing and sales side because that is actually, I think, the more in-demand piece. Maybe I'm just in, it's because I'm in the microcomp bubble, microcomp tiny C bubble, right? Which is more technical people. But I kind of lean towards that. I think around the time I wrote Start Small, Stay Small, which is what, I wrote it in 09, right? So this is like 15 years ago. I remember being like, man, anyone, I'm, I'm being a little flippant here, but like anyone can write software. Anyone can build a product. I know so few people who can sell it or who can market it or who can copyright and build a funnel and figure out how to grind and figure out SEO or AdWords or just generate interest in something, right? So that to me, I I think might be my bias is learning that side of it. And as you said, you can do a step one business and you learn a little bit of it and then you you level up and you it's all the tool belt I always talk about, right? Is you learn SEO or you learn, um, you know, AdWords or you learn whatever and you just keep stacking those on top of each other. Yeah, it is an interesting time to be a software engineer right now because so much is rapidly evolving with AI assistance, to be honest. Like, like I don't, I'm still very bullish on the value that these provide and I, I 
will frequently use ChatGPT or Copilot or whatever to to solve little problems involving code. But I mean, this is this is moving in the direction where AI can do so much more of technical implementation. I think it's only going to get more and more. That doesn't mean there's not going to be demand for software developers to to know how to like use the use the AI tools to pull things together. But if I think about like where is the value in like bringing something to market? I mean, it's more about how well can you sell it as opposed to like can you get the actual product implemented? If that makes sense. Yeah, and obviously with no code, there's ways to kind of you know hack stuff together. And what is the name of the thing? Have have you been on Twitter today? Where it's literally is it called Devin? <laughs> Yep. It yeah. just, I mean, hours ago, right? People yeah. know how, how long in advance we recorded, but hours ago, it's yeah. like Devin can write code. And look, is it going to replace developers? I don't think so. I think it's going to make great developers more productive. I do think it will make earlier stage developers hopefully get there faster. So I, th- yeah, it feels like that gap is shrinking. And I don't see that gap shrinking with sales and marketing. I mean, AI helps, but it's like it's dealing with humans. Yeah. Right. And that's, that's the hard part. So I think I lean towards that. If I had nothing, I would learn the quote unquote business side. But what I mean by that is marketing and or sales, depending, you know, and, and marketing is what it's generating demand, right? It's figuring out how to create inbound channels and how to position and copyright and present and all that. And to me, sales is outbound outreach and then actually doing demos and closing deals, right? Those are the two. That's how I separate them in my mind. So thank you for that question, Tomas. I hope that was helpful. Our next question comes to us from Malcolm. Hey, Rob. I want to thank you for all that you do and all the information you give to us. I'm trying to bootstrap an application into the ATS world and HR world. And I'm realizing that my idea is, one, not original, two, very competitive, and that there are a lot of people doing it, and a lot of people with more funding doing it as well. And I wanted to know, I know you started Drip. I know you were also into this competitive market. How do you find confidence to continue on with the bootstrap? And how do you decide whether to keep going with it or to pivot into something else? i really like to know. And again, thank you for all that you do, all your information. It's been really helpful and really great. So Derek, I picked this one specifically for us because Malcolm... <laughs> Malcolm is entering a competitive space, and we did that with Drip. For those who don't know, he said ATS, which is an applicant tracking system. So it is like an HR tool, much like Jazz is the one that that we used, remember, after Drip was acquired. And there's several others. I don't remember the name of them offhand, but... Greenhouse. Thank and, you. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. And so it is, a, it is a competitive space. And I believe at a certain point he says, my idea is not unique. Because the first time I heard it, I thought he said my idea is unique, but then I think he he said it's not unique, so it's not necessarily novel, right? So, yeah. What are your thoughts on entering a competitive space like this and bootstrapping at that at that rate? Right. Yeah, and I'm currently in it right now, Savvy Cal. I mean, similar kind of thing. Lots of lots of entrenched competitors, some 800 pound gorillas in the space where most people kind of know that name, and so. Yeah, so how do you do this? Well, I think first of all, like competition is not inherently bad, right? It's a signal that like there is a market here, people are spending money on software to solve this problem. So if there wasn't that, it would be concerning too. Now, it is trickier the more entrenched competitors there are and, you know, the, the more you're up against. So, I would think about, you know, before entering the space, I mean, I think you first want to have a pretty strong hypothesis about why the market needs another alternative. And how you're actually going to stand out from the incumbents. And I think if there's if it's mu- if it's more of a greenfield type of market where there's not a ton of single kind of purpose applications solving this problem, then you have more you have more leeway to just sort of solve the problem well and and come in and be one of the first. But if you, if you're far from being the first, then you really need to have a compelling story around around why. And I mean that is something you can you can use to your advantage. I think about the the classic case of like HubSpot, right? Who like sort of invented a category. They're, they're the ones who who often get mentioned for doing that. And you're in the opposite position here where like the category is well established. People that you're selling to potentially already know the names of the competitors that you would really be going up against. So you can draft off of that that familiarity they have and speak to kind of very specific pain points that they might have or limitations of the software 
and kind of assume that they have a base level of knowledge already if they've kind of aware of the existing tooling. And that's not a luxury that everybody has. If, if you're trying to educate a market about a problem space, you can't just assume people already kind of know what's out there. So be thinking about how to use that to your benefit if you can come up with that strong hypothesis about why does the market need a, a, a new option. Be thinking about niching down. I mean, trying to be a general purpose ATS system up against billion dollar companies that are also general purpose ATS systems is probably going to be a really, really tough road. But that can be to your advantage if they're trying to serve the needs of everybody. Maybe there are some verticals that are really feeling like they're fighting the system constantly. And if they just had something that was an ATS for X, then that's potentially a place where you could slot yourself in. You know, with with Drip, we found people were begrudgingly using a crusty old tool, Infusionsoft, right? And it like, didn't really solve their problems very well, and it was super clunky, but they were managing to make it work. And that was a really strong signal to us that like, okay, maybe there's an opportunity to actually purpose build something for this use case um, that people are going through a lot of pain right now to try to, to try to solve. So if you find like, maybe there's an industry vertical where they're using some software and then they're like, cobbling together Zapier and spreadsheets and a bunch of other kind of digital duct tape to, to make something work, like that could be a sign that there's something there to actually solve in a first class way. So those are some initial thoughts. Yeah, those are all spot on. And I think niching down is probably something that I would think about in this case, because what worked with Drip there, think of the things that were in place for Drip to work. Number one, it was like my fifth company. Like I was, I already had some experience. I had a lot of marketing, I had a lot of sales. Self-funded, 150 to 200 grand in cash to get us there. And so it's like, if you don't have these things, like, I don't know, it may not have worked without that. We had the hated incumbents, as you said. It was called Infusionsoft at the time, and their name is now Keep. Did you know that? K-E-A-P? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there was something called Entreport, which I'm assuming they're still around. But So we had these hated incumbents. They had artificially high prices. They were priced more than they needed to be because there was no one undercutting them. And so it was easy to come in and still have great profit margins and be half or a third or a fifth of their price. Their sales process was crappy, $2,000 upfront fee, annual only. Didn't You didn't even see the product until you signed the contract on purpose because their software was so bad. So it's like, think of all that stuff. And when I think about Jazz or Greenhouse or whoever else we could think of, I don't know the space well enough to know if it's that bad Oh, the other thing we had was we had these early adopters who would easily switch, right? So we had bloggers and kind of solo SaaS founders or solo info market people who really were okay with leaving MailChimp or leaving Infusionsoft if we built a better product. Does the ATS market have that? I don't know. I don't know who the early adopters would be. So to me, it's the hated incumbent and the pricing, lack of price sensitivity, the fact that the the pricing is so high and you can come in pretty easily. So I'm not saying all of those have to be in a market for it to work, but I am saying those were the the tailwinds that we had. And, you know, let's say that none of those were there. Would it have worked? Would Drip have grown as quick? I don't, I don't think so. Now, would it still have, could it still have been successful? Maybe. Maybe we would have pivoted in a different way, or maybe we would have niched down or done something. I mean, we kind of niched down anyways, right? It's like we were focused on, it was SaaS, bloggers, Originally, remember, it was WordPress, but that was just because of my audience, and then we moved away from that. And then actually e We didn't even advertise or like market to e at all, but at a certain point, we had like 15% of our customers were e-com folks. This is before the rise of Clavio, really. So there were some things. We made some, some good calls. We got a little lucky, but we were smart enough to know we were getting lucky, right? I, I often think of that. Like We happened to hit the space right as marketing automation became a thing, and before MailChimp had implemented it, because if we had <laughs> a year or two later, MailChimp had it. And so did, I don't know, just all the, old, the older players like AWeber and such implemented it. And I really think the market kind of closed down for new offerings to do the same thing. Yeah, I mean, it became much more difficult. I mean, you see, you see people entering like user list today, you know, like entering the space as like we're focusing on SaaS. And they've now implemented workflows and a lot of the things that come with your, your typical marketing automation platform. But they're, they're later to the game and I'm sure it's been a, a, a probably a harder road for them than, than it was for us at the time. Because you know, there was sort of a, a shift happening where email marketing was maturing. And I think it was founded on a hypothesis that, that sort of you had from 
you know, trying to do email marketing really well for software businesses and finding all the rough edges with MailChimp. I mean, that was sort of, so there, there were some strong hypotheses there on like this email is enduring. It's, it's something that's probably not going to die for a very long time as a really foundational marketing channel. And yet the tooling is lacking in, you know, these 10 ways. So there were, there were a lot of strong hypotheses there that we started with. And I think that's, that's a really important thing. You talk about having a vision or an opinion, right? If I was going to go try to start an ATS, I would want an opinion that like kind of differed from the market. And I'm not even saying the original opinion I had about Drip was right, because it was like kind of right, but kind of not. And we just, but then we wandered and figured it out. We took the signals from the market and there was market pull and into the automation space. We didn't even, marketing automation was not even in the original <laughs> draft of Drip at all, right? Not in the code, not in my vision or whatever. Well, obviously I can't make a recommendation for you, Malcolm. I would consider like, Instead of building an ATS SaaS, like, is there a way to do a step one business in HR? Do these SaaS, these ATSs have marketplaces where you could build an add-on that did something unique and it just removes a lot of the headache of it? Not even just the headache, just the headwinds. It's just hard to get a SaaS off the ground. Uh, it always has been, but I, I do think today it's, you know, even more crowded and is there opportunity for that step one business? Then you buy it at your own time and then you learn the market and you have customers and you have quote unquote an audience. It's really just your marketing list and your customers, but at least then you're not starting from zero if you go to build a standalone SaaS. So thanks for the question, Malcolm. I hope that was helpful. Our next question is about building a dashboard and balancing complexity and ease of use. Hey, Rob. I really enjoy the podcast. We're building a B2B web application where a lot of the value is in bringing together data from multiple platforms and presenting to users in an interactive dashboard for them to drill down into the data and get actionable insights. If product market fit proves right, we could be charging anywhere from 200 to a couple thousand dollars a month based on the value that it provides the customers given its size. The question is, how do you build a dashboard tool that looks and feels worth the price tag? What is the balance on complexity for data analysis and simplicity for ease of use? My concern is that customers would think that they could build this themselves. And to be honest, I'm afraid that they could with some integrations in a dashboard template tool. For context, we're using Bubble developers to build this web application. Thanks a lot for your guidance. All right, Derek. So they're building something on Bubble dashboard, and he's concerned. Will people just want to build it on their own? Or maybe they even can build it on their own. What What do you think about this? Yeah. So I think he, he couched this as like a a design problem, but I actually think it's maybe a value problem because you don't want to the persuasiveness of your value proposition to rest on how easy or hard something appears to implement to be to implement. You know. Now, maybe his market is in the place where they would not entertain using no-code tools to assemble this together, in which case it's, it's not really a concern. You know, Maybe it's, this is already enough value provided to them because they're highly non-technical or whatever. I get the sense that perhaps this market is decently technical enough where he's concerned that maybe there's not enough there for them to, um, to want to buy a product to do it. So I think the, the big questions to kind of think through is like, how are your prospects getting this data today? Why do they need it assembled into a dashboard? Is it really is it really adding that much value to what they're currently doing right now to solve their problem? And it seems like he may have a hypothesis there already on like why it's better in a dashboard as opposed to being cobbled together manually. You know, what insights are they looking for? Can you think about how to like not just present the data but actually make it actionable in a way where they would have to do a lot more work to to get at that rather than just presenting the data. So I think it's, yeah, overall I'm thinking of this less as a user experience problem. I mean, obviously you want it to be as nice to use as possible. I mean, maybe it's, not, you know, it's, it's just raw data, like usability may not be so much a concern, but it's like, what is the problem you're actually solving? What's the job to be done here? And then, you know, be thinking about like, if you're trying to get a sense for what the value is, I mean, you could just think about if it's a manual process today, what is your typical customer? How much time are they spending? And what type of person is gathering this? Like, what's that person's salary? How many hours a month are they spending cobbling this together? There's a rough proxy for what it might be worth to a company. And that could 
weave its way into your into your marketing, you know, to, to kind of make the clear case on why they should pay you instead of do the work manually. Yeah, I will admit I have a little bit of a bias against dashboards. It's not a never. This is not mistakes entrepreneurs make, two-sided marketplace, bootstrap, B2C, whatever. It's not that strong. But most of the dashboards that I've seen folks build in the dashboarding software winds up being a nice to have. And it's something that people kind of don't look at. I, I saw both, I don't know if you remember, like Dan Norris launched something like informally or something like that. And he just could, he's like, switching cost is so easy because people just OAuth into the next one. People just forget to look at it. It's just not that valuable. And I remember this was like 10 plus years ago. Since then, with MicroConf, I wanted a dashboard that could just show us kind of a lot of our KPIs, which is like how many subscribers in Drip, how many subscribers on YouTube, how many subscribers on Twitter. You know, you can imagine other things. It's purely top level audience metrics because MicroConf and TinySeed, frankly, are audience driven businesses. And I would try one and it would be around for a few months and then it would either shut down, be aqua hired, or they would completely pivot from suddenly it's like, well, minimum pricing is 500 a month, which I'm like, oh, great, you're going enterprise. This is not that valuable to us. I mean, I, I was like 50 bucks a month. I would totally pay for this. 99s were really pushing it, you know, and by the time you're in, in triple digits. So I've just seen these businesses over and over kind of not work. And I think there is a bit of nice to haveness around it. And that's what you were getting at was what is the real job to be done here? If I were to build a dashboard myself, I would instantly be thinking, how can I do it in a way that has some stickiness? to where it, it pulls in proprietary data or it pulls in data from data stores that are really hard to get data out of or it has enough AI in it that it has a unique take that if I just switch to the next read-only thing that I OAuth into, oh, I have my five accounts, I OAuth in, oh, it shows me the same thing. Like You're just a commodity at that point. How do you make this A, not a commodity, and B, like a mission-critical piece? So is it sending a weekly or a daily email with updates? Is it doing some type of analysis? Or is it, like you said, if the job to be done is actually, oh, crap, I see a problem in our funnel, well, then are there ways for me to start optimizing the funnel in the app? Are there ways that, oh, I'm also going to build um, heat maps into this now because the next thing is to do heat maps. Or, you know, I'm, it's a contrived example, but you get the feeling it's like just a dashboard on its own. I don't know that I can think of like a wildly popular multi million dollar SaaS that is just that. I'm sure someone will chime in. Questions at startupfortherestwest.com if you want to. You know, there are hundreds of successful email service providers, there are hundreds of successful, uh, at least I, I would guess hundreds, ATSs. You know, as a callback, there are hundreds of successful ERPs and CRMs, and there are these big categories with a lot of players that are doing millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, and more dashboards, it's not it. And so again, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying there are these headwinds that I've seen and I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure how I would get around that, you know, if I was thinking about building one. Yeah. I think about like, um, <laughs> think about profit well versus bear metrics, right? And like profit well took the aggressive freemium approach with upsell into, you know, Dunning and other kind of added on services, their, you know, pricing, consulting, all this kind of stuff. But we're like giving away the part that was commoditized. And I suspect for a lot of dashboards, like the actual just presentation of the metrics, maybe that's that's the commodity part. And then you're looking for ways to like upsell into more valuable insights. I mean, I think about like New Relic is like a application metrics tracking system and it's extremely powerful and they give away a ton for free. And they have certain features in there that are like, we will automatically look for anomalies in your system, like deep in your OS metrics, your database metrics, application level metrics, and try to correlate them together and then let you know when we see some kind of weird anomaly that you may want to take action on. And that kind of stuff is like extremely difficult to, to derive on your own. I think about, yeah, stuff that's like, the moment it's something starts turning in the wrong direction, if we can alert you to that, well, now we're talking real value there because otherwise I have to go and be constantly pulling these metrics myself and manually trying to spot anomalies. I think about even SAS metrics, like I would love for something to tell me if churn starts to turn in an opposite direction, like is this just noise or is something more fundamentally broken? And could a dashboard like look at a bunch of different metrics across my SaaS business and try to give me at least a guess on like, I think this thing changed and now this is causing a spike in churn, you know, I don't know, just an idea, but like things that are things that dig a little bit deeper than just the presentation of the metrics, I think would be a good place to look. Yeah. It seems like you and I are in consensus on this of like, how do you make this so they can't 
just build it in bubble in a week. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks for that question. I hope it was helpful. Our next question is about a solo tech founder hiring slash outsourcing marketing roles. Hey Rob, this is Vinat here. Um, first off, I'm a huge fan of everything that you've been doing over the years. I've read all your books and listened to this podcast regularly. Uh, you're doing great work. A big thanks for that. Let me uh, jump to the question. See, uh, I've seen lots of uh, tips and tricks and advices and I've had lots of discussions about non-tech founders hiring their uh, engineers or outsourcing their development, the best practices, etc. And you yourself have had uh, quite a bit of discussion about this on this podcast. But I couldn't find much info on the other side of the coin, which is developers hiring their uh, marketing team. Being a solo tech founder, when should you approach hiring a dedicated marketing person or outsourcing your marketing stuff? Uh, at the early stages, you could do most of the stuff yourself, but it comes at the cost of uh, building out your product and talking to customers. And also since marketing takes time to start showing results, it has a very long feedback loop. It doesn't seem wise to uh, spend your time building out that content or uh, setting up that PPC campaigns and whatnot. And there's also this advice about you shouldn't hire uh, anyone until you're sure the product has merits and everything. So all of this is conflicting. So my question is like, uh, when should a solo tech founder approach the marketing uh, hire and uh, how should they go about it? Thanks. What do you think about this, Derek? Yeah, so... I mean, I think, isn't your quote like, start marketing the day you start coding or the before, whatever, mm -hmm. right? I think that's a that's mm -hmm. a good rule of thumb, right? So I think he's right. He calls out that like a lot of marketing things take a while to ramp up. Like they're not immediately, especially if you're investing in SEO or content or things that just you're, you're trying to get mind share and it, it doesn't happen overnight. And so I think it's wise to be thinking about, you know, trying to trying to invest in in capturing some mind share and building building up flywheels um, from the start, I have some experience doing this outsourcing marketing. So I, with SavvyCal, I was the solo developer for about a year at least um, on the product, and there was a lot of catch up work to do. So I was I was deep in the product, trying to you know build all the table stakes features and implement our our parts that made us unique. So once as soon as I had enough traction to kind of indicate that I think we're on to something here. I think the market likes what we're building. So I was at a couple thousand dollars in MRR is when I decided to bring on um, Corey as outside marketing help. And he was just a part-time contractor to start because I couldn't afford to hire someone full-time. And he was working on all kinds of stuff, landing pages, writing emails, our product hunt launch, hiring freelance copywriters to, to build out SEO content. Just all kinds of things that you want to be working on. And I, I would have liked to have had my hands in those things, but I was too busy building product and I needed to be focused on that. I probably wouldn't have been able to do that without tiny seed funding. So that that helped me, you know, be able to invest in that before I could support it with revenue. So I think it's it's even harder if you're trying to purely more purely bootstrap without, you know, a, a seed of cash to do that. You have to then be a bit scrappier and try to kind of divide your time. I see people doing things like alternating marketing week and coding week and some of these some of these different ways to try to like make sure you can get deep enough into it so you can focus on the two different disciplines without too much context switching. So there's some hacks like that that people do. But uh, yes, in general, I think you should be focusing on marketing from day one, whether that means you know, you're being scrappy and doing it or you're getting some outside help. Yeah, and the reason I wanted you to be on when I answered this is that you are one of the only founders I know who hired out zero to one marketing. When I look at the list, I have this list I keep of a &R and I keep of all the tiny seed companies that are over a million in ARR. And it's a, it, you know, it's, it's a pretty long list, which is great. I believe without fail, every single one of them, the founder or one of the founders was the, essentially the marketing lead, the marketing strategist. Because zero to one marketing, Ruben and I were just, Ruben, founder of Signwell and I were talking about this over the last week of just how few zero to one marketers there are. And as a founder, how you usually have to do that yourself. It's kind of like, oh, I don't like sales. So I'm going to hire a salesperson to do sales from the start. It's like founders, the best 
person to sell. Founder is the best person to market. Now you you bucked that trend, but you also found Corey, who is Corey Haynes. For those who don't know, he is one of the few people that I know who can do that type of zero one. Right? There's like Asia Arangio, and then a lot of the founders we know, like think of like Craig Hewitt or Ruben Gomez. You know, they these are zero to one. Jordan Gall is another one, right? Who can zero to one the marketing. The challenge is so marketing is the most complex department in SaaS because it has all these different roles. Like if, if we're going to go into software, right, or I'm sorry, just the engineering side of SaaS, it's like, okay, there's senior engineers, there's back-end engineers, there's front-end, there's design and stuff. That feels pretty straightforward to me. In marketing, there's marketing strategy, which is like, what should we try next or what should we double down on next? And that part is always a lot of hand wave. It's just hard. There's no exact formula. I talk about in the SaaS playbook, the ICE formula for it, but it's a framework and nothing more than that. So there's strategy. Then there's actual like project management, like kind of who's orchestrating, pushing it forward, getting it done, making sure people are doing. Then there's the individual contributors, the people who are doing the actual work. Sometimes as a founder, you're all of those. You know what I mean? And I didn't even realize that they were different things until we were acquired. It was probably about the time we were acquired where I was like, oh, huh, there's like people here and all they do is think about marketing strategy. They don't actually do anything. And it's like, yeah, when you have a 30 person marketing team, that's how you divide it up. So the individual contributors for folks to know, if you're doing SEO, well, you need someone to do the keyword research. You need people to be working on link building. You need people to actually create the content that you're creating. Like, And you can have a team of people to do each of those things at a big company. Like you bet at HubSpot, there's, they probably have 10 or 20 writers they work with. They probably have five SEO strategy, 10 SEO strategy people, you know, because they're a public company. And so this is where it becomes a challenge. Is it's like saying, if I'm a developer and I'm going to hire this out, it's like, what parts are you talking about? Again, aside from you, I don't have an example of a dev founder, who, a mostly bootstrap founder, who was able to hire out marketing strategy and succeed. Yeah. And I will say that it, it, was, it was definitely a collaborative effort on, on kind of who owned it. So it wasn't like I was hiring him and not having any say or hand in marketing strategy. But I do also think there's a difference between what Corey brought to the table, which I, I guess I would term him like a full stack marketer, right? Like we think about, we know the concept of full stack developers where we know enough to be dangerous at all levels of the stack pretty much and can, can get, stuff, get stuff rolling. Like was there are you know SEO experts that probably know more about SEO than Corey did, and there's you know content experts that know more about that discipline. But but he's also you know enough of a generalist where we could put our heads together and we could execute on stuff, and he could think strategically and then also do some of the grunt work himself, and and not just not just have to to hand everything off to subject matter experts. So I think that was I, I would agree that I I don't see this happening often either, and you have an even more bigger data set than I have on on being able to see that. So I perhaps it's not something that's easily replicatable, and kind of what we what we mentioned earlier, right? There's a lot more developers out there than there are full stack marketers. So it's it's just a rarer skill set to find. And even now, Corey is he's doing an agency now, and you know I I don't know if there's another Corey in this in the position where I found him when he was kind of just taking on a few clients and had the bandwidth to do that kind of work. So it probably is a pretty rare thing to find. And I don't know what that, how that bodes for other founders who are trying to replicate the model, you know? Yeah. I think if you want it to be replicable, replicatable, that I, as a developer, I would learn enough marketing to be dangerous. And look, even if you don't do it all yourself, you learn the frameworks and therefore you can evaluate marketers that you hire. Because much like there are a bunch of developers you can hire who will write really code in your SaaS product, there are a bunch of marketers who you'll hire who will provide no value for the money you're paying them. And the more you know about any subject, the more likely you are to be able to evaluate them. So thanks for that. I like this question. I think it's a, it's a really good one. I hope that was helpful. The last question for the day is about building on OpenAI or probably any LLM and how the variable costs scale. Hi, my name is Martin, and I want to hear your opinion on the impact of building over services like OpenAI and other AI services on the PNL. So typically on a purely B2E SaaS, as you scale, and you get more and more customers, the margins would be pretty good. You would be having maybe 80 plus, 90 plus cross margin. But now that I'm building on, on the OpenAI API, it feels more like having a cost of goods sold, you know? Um, I used to work at my dad's restaurant. And so the way I'm looking at my PL right now, it feels more like I have this 
cost of goods sold, which is the OpenAI API, just impacting everything in my business, you know? And so I kind of want to hear your opinion on the future of SaaS. Obviously, in the long term, open source models might become even better. You might just switch to that. But at least in the short term, I feel like we are all building over like Google's Anthropics or OpenAI's you know, services. And it's a viral cost. And it's a huge viral cost on everything that we do. Obviously, there's ways to reduce the, the reliance on OpenAI, maybe not calling the API all the time for repetitive tasks or something like that. But all in all, like the more you grow, um, the more you're going to rely on these services. So the variable costs are going to scale as you scale your revenue, which is not something typically in B2B SaaS. So I want to hear your opinion on this. Thank you so much. So Derek, before I toss it to you, I want to roll us back. Remember, after Drip was acquired and we were having scaling issues, we would increase the size of our database, the Amazon EC2 instance, the moment there was more RAM. And I forget, wasn't it like we had terabytes of RAM on that thing, right? Yeah. And we're like, oh my gosh, there's one with two terabytes because it would just help because our database became kind of a, a single bottleneck. And I remember at a certain point going to the CFO and saying, how much can I spend on this? Yeah. Like how much makes sense? Because we are we have infinity money because we're now venture backed, 38 million in venture, you know, the acquirer. And he was like, look, good rule of thumb is that you want your infrastructure cost to be under 15% of your gross revenue. And I had never heard that. And I was like, that's great. And we actually got it. I believe at one point it was up to like 17 or 18% as we were doing it. But then we, we pulled it down over time as we had some improvements and stuff. So that's a loose rule of thumb. I also did a survey in the Tiny Seed Slack a couple of years ago now and was just asking people, what's, what's your percentage? And a lot of people were like one to 5%. You know, if you, if you build Basecamp, <laughs> it's just not that, you know, I don't want to, you know, discount it, but it's just not that, it's not that resource intensive to do create, read, update, delete, right? So there are a lot of people in the one to five. So it's somewhere in that one to 15% range, I think. And I would include your hosting. I would include sending, like we had to send a lot of emails. I would include sending SMS. I would include an LLM. It's your cost of infrastructure to run the app. So with that in mind, I would guess almost certainly that if you build on OpenAI and people are using it a lot, that you're way over 15%. And so how do you think this founder should think about it? Yeah, I mean, I think that the amount that you're having to pay out of what you're charging is sort of sort of correlates with where is most of the value lying, right? So, so if you're just a very simple wrapper where almost every single operation that occurs is kind of just a, a crafting a you know, crafting a, a prompt and then passing it off to OpenAI and then returning the results. Like if it's mostly just kind of a, a thin layer on top, I think it's it's a little bit of a precarious position to be on. I think we're going to see a whole generation of of OpenAI wrappers kind of see some really tough days coming up as as you know the the boundaries sort of bleed on who owns what part of the stack. And obviously the the LLM providers are in the in the decidedly, you know, power seat here. Um, so I think it's, I would just be concerned about the risk, kind of the, uh, it's, I guess, platform risk. I don't know what kind of risk we would term this, but it's it's the it's the infrastructure risk of, of who you're relying on for um, for most of the value from your product. I guess it would be platform risk, but are you, are you saying that if the price goes up or just if they went away or like screwed you as the, as the LLM that you're basically built on top of them? Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's price. Like you, you don't you have no almost no control over what your costs are going to be. There, you're kind of at their mercy. Um, if, especially if you're like deeply embedded into their LLM, I don't know how portable implementations would be. If OpenAI starts jacking you around, could you just move over to Gemini or whatever and and be able to keep rolling? Or you know, is there something very specific to to that platform that you're relying on? So it, it just sort of centralizes a lot of risk. So you're at risk of them raising prices. You're at risk of them competing with you directly and just sort of marketing what you've exactly built as now a feature of their of their chat system. You know, and again, it's it's not all about just having the functionality. It's how well are they marketing it and how well are you marketing it, <laughs> where you can still potentially build a, a business on that. But I think it's just it's just a bit precarious right now, especially with with AI systems. I mean, it's something I'm thinking about a lot as it's like, how much AI do I build into my product? And how much of this is just going to become the thing that you give to your AI agent assistant um, that you're paying some other system for? And so I think there's a lot of wasted effort happening right now where people are kind of racing to try to build AI into their products only to potentially see that just kind of become obsolete or, or get implemented a different layer of the stack. 
when I was thinking about this, it reminded me of a handful. And I, if I were to make up a number off the top of my head, it's let's see, I've invested in 171 companies to date. And I believe probably 15 or 20 of them send SMS. And the SMS text messages are different than emails because they're really expensive to send, like a lot. And I don't remember if it's 10 or 100 times more, but it is significantly more. And so they face this question too, because how do you ramp up your pricing in essence? That's a question. How do you ramp up your pricing, as you said, with the value they receive? And so there are, I probably won't walk through all the ways, but there's really like, there's three ways to do it where you can just have pure tiers. Pure tiers is like, think about Drip where it had 2,500 subscribers. And if you go to 2,501, you're just at a different tier, right? We would upgrade or downgrade you in a given month. So you could do that with number of AI requests, right? Or number of text messages sent, right? Then you can do tiers with overages that include a certain amount of SMS and it goes over, or you can do tiers that don't include messages at all. So meaning you could just, you pay this much to have access to the tool and then you pay per query or you pay per hundred query, you buy in blocks, you buy in credit, right? So that it personally is how I would think about it. Now, where's the problem with that, Derek? The problem is, is there so many AI tools that have raised so much funding that they don't give a shit about profitability. And so they're going to undercut you and they're going to charge 10 bucks for something that costs you 20 bucks because it's land grab Uber Amazon time. You know what I mean? So that's the problem with the AI space, or it is an issue with bootstrapping in the AI space is that it's, it's not that you're just a commodity or might have competitors. It's that if they're so well-funded that they don't need to be profitable for one, two, three years, then how can you do what I just said? You know, charge based on number of SMSs sent, right? Or the number of AI calls. Because people be like, oh my gosh, my bill was $40 last month for this thing that open I only charges 10 or 15. And it's like, yeah, it's because they have infinity money and I don't, and I have to actually pay bills. So again, I've presented how I would think about it and then how I'm not sure it's <laughs> going to work because of how frothy the AI space is. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I have the the guts to to build in that space. But I I applaud anyone who does. I think there's there's interesting opportunities for sure that will emerge. There is yeah. a lot of opportunity. Yep, and that's the appeal of it, right? Is it's it's there are a lot of acquisitions happening, and there's a lot of people rushing into it. I mean, Finchat.ai is a you know is a tiny company that pivoted from Stratosphere and doing seven figures in like a matter of months. Seven Figures AR, that, that episode actually went live today as we're recording this. So there's a tons of opportunity, but also with that opportunity comes, you know, they call it, there's blue ocean, red ocean, like it is red ocean. And so you have to be aware of that, that at any point you can get sideswiped, so to speak, or, or that the, it's not fair. It's not a com fair competitive landscape because if people are better funded than you, they can, they'll just wait you out. Yeah. So I'm not saying don't do it, just be aware of what you're getting into. Derek Reimer, it is absolute pleasure to have you back on the show. Folks want to keep up with you on Twitter. You are Derek Reimer and, of course, SavvyCal.com if they want to see what you're up to. Oh, and DerekReimer.com, right? You publish stuff every now and again. You write a blog post every... Yeah, not, not as often as I'd like, but yeah, it's my, it's my little home on the internet. DerekReimer.com. Thanks again, man. Thanks. Thanks for listening this week and every week. And thanks again to Derek for joining me on the show, taking an hour out of his day to record with me. I hope the spring is treating you well and that the goals that you've set in your mind for 2024 are moving forward each day as you push that boulder up a hill. This is Rob Walling signing off from episode 708. <laughs>